All right. Revelation 10. Revelation 10. Um, this is our journey of understanding. Um, you know, there's a verse I want to look up. I'll probably, I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, but anyway, we're understanding Revelation 10. We're trying to trying to understand who this is speaking of. Again, my uh, when, when I first studied this, and we're, this has been several years ago, uh, it it sort of led me to believe that this was talking about Jesus, and um, in all the things that I've studied and all the things that I've seen since then, I've never really been. Um, I've never been pulled away and looked at it and said, no, it can't be. It totally can't be. Uh, my idea is scripture cannot be broken. Scripture's right no matter what, and I'm wrong no matter what. And uh, so we just let scripture interpret scripture. <clears throat> but the verses are, uh, in verses 1 and 2, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, and he's clothed with a cloud. That's Christ, I believe, appearing in the clouds. He's coming in the clouds. And a rainbow was upon his head. Ezekiel said that was the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And the God doesn't share his glory with another. His face uh, was, as it were, the sun. And uh, Christ is the light of the world. He's the son of righteousness uh, who arises with healing in his wings. Um, he is the sun and the shield over the earth. He is... Um, um, in Matthew 17, he, on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, God didn't transfigure Christ's face, his countenance, to look like the moon. So he's not the man on the moon. Uh, he made his face to shine as the sun. Moses was a foreshadowing of that when he came down from Mount Sinai the second time with the law in his hands. The law was glorious. That's what Paul said, that the law back then was glorious and Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with his face shining so bright that the Israelites can't, or yeah, the people of Israel can't handle it. And they want Moses to put a veil over his face. And Paul said that veil is still there when the Jews read the Old Testament. And I thought of that. I mentioned this here a while back. I was in an airport one time. I think I was flying out of Baltimore, headed somewhere else uh, to do some meetings and um, there was a, a, a Jewish rabbi, or I say he's a rabbi, he may not have been, but uh, I mean, he wore the, the black uh, fedora and he had a black jacket on, black pants, and uh, he, just, he just looked like a rabbi. Uh, but anyway, he was reading the Old Testament in Hebrew, and uh, I thought of that. I thought of what Paul said, that when the Jews read the Old Testament, there's a veil over it, and they cannot see who that is behind that veil. So I'm sure most Jews know something about Jesus Christ. But what they're told and what they believe is, is that he is a, a, a Gentile Messiah, that uh, he's not the Jewish Messiah, couldn't be the Jewish Messiah, and uh, I, I marvel, Brother George, at all these uh, online teachers and all these books where people write and they tell you that the only proper way to understand Christ is to understand him through the eyes of the Jewish people. And in other words, understand him in the Jewish way and not the Gentile way. Well, the Jews are wrong. And the Jews are half blind and they have a veil over the face of whoever that is behind that veil. And so why would, I, why would I choose to go from seeing with both of my eyes to going down to be blinded partially and then to put a veil even over that, what I see? Because they do not understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament, all the prophecies, everything. He is the fulfillment of that. And so anyway, his face was as it were the sun. And now uh, we're going to look at his feet as pillars of fire. So when I say pillars of fire, what immediately comes to mind? The Exodus. The Exodus okay. Uh, Charlton Heston, right? Okay. The Ten Commandments. Um, 
Yeah, God led Israel. Uh, turn to Exodus 13. God led Israel in the Old Testament with, and here's, here's something that, uh, as I study this further, I'm still learning. I am. I, I, I picked up on something, uh, last night with this that I'd never really thought of before. I had, I had wondered in previous times why, um, his feet were not pillars of smoke, but they were pillars of fire. In Exodus 13, verse 21, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar. And I've been saying it wrong. I've been, I went to look for the phrase pillar of fire uh, in my King James Bible. Let me pull that up. And it's not in the Bible. And I'm going, well, there must be some mistake. But rule number one is, there are no mistakes. So I type in pillar of fire, and that's uh, six times. Pillar of cloud, zero. Now, I don't know what significant it makes, but it's pillar of a cloud is what God says. Uh, and that's uh, three times. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them what? Light. Now think about what this means to go by day and by night. So now, think of what this means. During the day, he's leading them with something they can see, the pillar of cloud. Um, and at night, in the Old Testament, uh, he's leading them uh, with a pillar of fire. The verse that we're looking at in Revelation says that it's his feet, not his foot, singular, but his feet, plural, that he's leading them with pillars of fire. Both of his feet. Now, contemplate this, because that verse that we just looked at said that uh, during the day he leads them with a pillar of cloud, pillar of a cloud, but at night he gives them fire by night to give them light. And that's one thing that the Jews are lacking in is light. They are still in darkness. And that darkness is something they just cannot, they cannot pierce the veil through their own religion, through their own study of the Old Testament, through all the traditions that they have developed over the last several thousand years. They just cannot pierce that veil and they do not know who God is. They do not know who the Lord is. They do not know who their Messiah is. So, the idea of his feet being pillars of fire and the fact that fire represents light tells me that we're dealing with the Word of God. The Bible. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So we're talking about how Israel is going to be led not in the Old Testament, but how Israel is going to be led at Christ's second coming. Not his first coming, but his second coming. Uh, I mentioned there was something I wanted to look at. And so let me, uh, let me type that in here. This is one of the verses that we looked at when we first started this, when we was talking about an angel coming down from heaven. I'm going to do a case-sensitive search. And in Exodus 23, behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. And then he said it again in verse 23, for mine angel, capital A, shall go before thee and bring thee into the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. Then I will cut them off. Uh, he says it in chapter 32 of, of Exodus. Um, therefore now go lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken of thee. Behold, mine angel, capital A, 
Four times there. Shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. So clearly God is going to send his angel, capital A, which is Christ. He's going to send. He said it three times here. Uh, and he mentions uh, Jacob here is mentioning it in Genesis 48. But anyway, he is uh, sending his angel, which we know to be Christ, down in the latter days to lead his people once again to their promised land. Only since we've understood that the pillar of fire represents the light and the word of God is the light, then instead of God leading Israel, and this is where people like John Hagee and, and others, I believe, are way, way off. Uh, they're not only out in left field, they're in foul territory with this one. John Hagee says that God is going to save Israel, but he's not going to do it the way he saved us. That God is going to restore sacrificial uh, or animal sacrifices. And that's how he's going to save them. That the Jews will go back to the practice of killing lambs and goats and oxen and fine flour and all that stuff, that they're going to go back to slitting the throats of bullocks, laying them up on the altar, washing the entrails, doing all the things that they did back in the Old Testament. And I see guys shaking their head. I don't believe it either. Because that would be an offense to the cross of Jesus Christ. Once you figure out that the blood of bulls and goats cannot atone for sin then it doesn't make sense that God would force the Jews to go back to that. It never forg God never forgave their sins with those. He rolled them onto Calvary. And Christ died for them. Amen. Because what the Jews did, when they did sacrifice the bulls and the goats and the lambs, they were doing it because God told them to do. They were acting in faith. Faith. So, when Christ came the first time, it represents, um, he, the Bible says that he was made under the law, made unto sin. He, was a, uh, he did not sin, but he, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So Christ comes the first time. That is God leading Israel to the promised land with one pillar of fire. Christ comes the second time. This is Christ leading Israel to the promised land with two pillars of fire. Old Testament and New Testament. And when the Jews, when they get a hold of the book of Hebrews, do you think they will believe that God wants them to go back and kill animals again for salvation? No. Uh, turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31. This is uh, a prophecy of the, of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. It's, God made it easy to remember. Call now. 555-3131. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Do you know what um, those who refer to themselves as following what they call Hebrew roots or they are uh, they believe in a, a Jewish uh, messianic concept where they believe that Christ came to cause us to follow the Old Testament law. Uh, and they believe that salvation then comes from Mount Sinai. They, they're called Hebrew roots. Uh, some, some of them are referred to as sacred name because they believe you can't say Jesus or God or Lord, that you have to say Yahuwah 
or Yahweh or Yahovah or Yahuwah or uh, Yahshua or Yeshua or Hoshua. They, they, and they fight amongst themselves on how to pronounce it. But they don't call the new covenant the new covenant. They call it the renewed covenant. Meaning that Christ came to renew the conditions of Mount Sinai for salvation. Mount Sinai required, and this is where they're all just completely off. Mount Sinai, God required strict obedience to every law. Every one of them. And, oh, I just love these little stupid things here. That if Israel does not keep every law, then there's the covenant's null and void. They, there's, there's, they get no blessing from it. And so here he says, it's not the renewed Mount Sinai covenant. It is a completely new covenant. And we'll find that out in a minute. That I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Note verse 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband to them, saith the Lord. So what does God say here in this verse? He says here that the new covenant isn't going to be anything like the old covenant. Nothing like it. In the day that I brought them out of Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai, gave them the Ten Commandments, told them that if they abide by these, they will live. And God says, that's not what this new covenant is going to be. This new covenant is not going to be about do and live. It's going to be believe and live and there is a difference but this covenant verse 33 but this shall be the covenant that i will make with the house of israel after those days saith the lord i will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts because you always do what's in your heart okay your heart oh i like this mm. your heart is your second brain. Think of it that way. And actually, I found this out. The human heart is actually composed of, in part, brain cells. Brain cells. Here. So when Paul said in Romans uh, 10... Uh, that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He didn't mention the mind anywhere. He said the heart. You believe it in your heart. And this is where people will either know the truth and be free or they will believe lies because they believe them in their heart. Uh, Ezekiel went to God in Ezekiel 14. And because the elders had come to Ezekiel and they say, inquire to Inquire to God for us and find out what he wants us to know. So Ezekiel went to God and said, God, they're asking me questions. I don't know what to answer them. And God said, should I be inquired at all of them? They have uh, a stumbling block in their heart. They have idols in their heart. So if I answer them, it's only going to be according to the abundance of the idols that they have in their heart. They've got sacred. Watch this now. They've got sacred cows here that you can't tip over. That you can't bypass. And I tell you what, I, in all the years I've been in church, all the years I've been in the ministry, been around other people, I can tell you that church people are bad about picking sacred cows to follow. Rules that are not even in the Bible. Guidelines and stipulations and man-made doctrine, man-made sins. Or doing things their own way, ignoring sin altogether. And saying, well, if they do it this way, then they will be saved. Where is, it, where is it in the Bible that a person has to recite a catechism? And if they recite the catechism, okay, then they're saved. Where is that in the Bible anywhere? It's not. That's a sacred cow. That's what I'm talking about. And with that cow there in their heart, they cannot attain to the truth. They never will. Yes, sir. Um, the scripture came up in my mind when you were saying that. Jared. 
Yeah, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's exactly what I'm saying. I just thought it was cool that God made my heart out of brain cells. That matches what we know from the Bible. Is that I can know things, I can know them here, but somebody can cause me to unknow them. But if I know them here, God is the only one who can change this. Amen? Amen. Uh, now, where was it? Oh, the New Covenant. Uh, verse 30, what were we on here? I will write, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be uh, my people. Uh, that's what Paul said. Um, I think he was referring to this, that, um, that when he told uh, that church, I think it was the Corinthian church, he said, you are our epistle written not with ink, but in fleshy tables of the heart. People will follow you if they know for a fact you really do believe what you say you profess. Because the, most lost people in this world are looking for someone. Thank you very much. You didn't spit in it, did you? Yeah, 90 proof saliva. Um, most people in most lost people in this world who are who end up looking for the truth. I guarantee you they know the difference between a phony Christian and a real one. Because in the workplace or in the family get togethers or in the neighborhood. They know who goes to church every morning and who doesn't. They also know of those people who go to church on Sunday morning. Uh, they know the people that are hypocrites in their neighborhood or at their workplace or wherever it is. They know those people. And so they're going to reach out not to the hypocrites and the phonies, but to the people who really believe in their heart what they say they believe on the outside. Amen to that. Now, um, well, let me finish with this here. Verse uh, 34, or no, verse 33 again. I will put my law in their with parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. I think Paul quoted that in 2 Corinthians 6 when he was talking about um, um, can, a, can you have a concord with Christ or what concord hath Christ with Belial? Um, God said, therefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive them. And they shall, my, they shall be my people and I shall be their God. So the bottom line is these, um, these fiery footprints, they represent the old and they represent the, the wholeness of the word of God, the old and the new Testament, one on the left side, one on the right side. And that's what they're going to follow in the last days. Will it be Christ? It will be every bit of Christ. Christ is the word of God and the word of God is Christ. And there's no separation from that. Uh, so his feet were as pillars of fire. Uh, Nehemiah chapter nine. Uh, you can turn there. Yea, when they had made them a molten calf and said, this is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt. See, remember I said they a lot of people put sacred cows in their heart and once that's there they just they have a hard time getting around it but anyway um they made a molten calf and said this is thy god that brought thee up out of egypt and had brought great provocations yet thou and thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness how many of you are amazed and surprised that god has not turned you over to a reprobate mind yet somebody say amen amen and so he said, uh, in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Even God was uh, very patient with his people because in the day that God wanted them to move, God would remove himself and the pillar of cloud or pillar of fire and he would go over outside the camp and wait for them. When the Israelites saw that the pillar of cloud had moved from the most holy place in the tabernacle to outside the camp, 
they didn't have to ask, what is that? What, what is God saying here? They automatically knew God was saying, pack everything up, get ready, load up, line up, because God had a specific place that he wanted each tribe in, and line up and follow me. And so that's, that's what they did. God made it very easy for them to know whether or not God was saying, let's go or not. So anyway, um, he says it in verse 19, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go to show them light. There he says it again. Verse 20, thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them and withheld us not thy manna from their mouth and gavest them water for their thirst. How did he give them water? That rock followed them. Paul said that. The rock that followed them was Christ. And so Moses, uh, when he first was told uh, to do something with the rock, he was told to smite it. And that's Christ being smitten at his first coming. And so Christ, that stone, that rock, followed them all through the wilderness. And every place they camped, no matter what, they always had water. And every place they camped, no matter where it was, they always had manna to feed them. Always. God was taking care. God didn't even let... What article of clothing was it that God didn't let wear off? Their shoes. That's exactly right. How would you like to wear the same pair of shoes for 40 years? Huh? I think some of you do. <clears throat> anyway... Uh, verse 20, thou, all, thou, watch this. I like this one. Verse 20, thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. I just like that adjective, that good spirit. To instruct them and withheld us not thy manna from their mouth and gave us them water for their thirst. Yea, 40 years. The number 40 indicates it's a, it's based upon the number four. And anytime you have the number four, you have the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, so for 40 years, this was God saving Israel. Okay? For 40 years, didst thou sustain them in the wilderness. And what happened was the old generation died off and a new generation was born to go into the promised land. And that's a picture of us when we're saved. The old man's got to die and the new man's got to go in. Uh, they lack so that they lack nothing. Their clothes wax not old and their feet swelled not. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations and didst divide them into corners. So they possessed the land of Sion and the land of the king of Heshbon and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You know what I did one time? I counted. The Bible gives you a list. When Moses was with the Israelites, God enabled him to kill two Kings, both of them were giants. Og, the king of Bashan, whose bed was, um, how many cubits was his bed? Huh? It's about 13 and a half feet is what it break, comes down to. And then Sion, king of the Amorites, both of them were giants. So Moses killed two. Later on, it gives a list of all the kings that Joshua killed. Those kings were killed so that Israel could have the inheritance of the land that those kings ruled over. You know how many kings Joshua killed? 31. How many is that all together? 33. Who was 33 on the cross? That's there for a reason. God is showing you that Christ was going to be the one who was going to, at his death, was going to kill his enemies with his death. I like that. Um, yeah, anyway. Now, the pillar of fire. Now, here's what, it, here's what I think is going on. It's not a pillar of cloud that his feet are like. It's a pillar of fire. So that tells you that it is night and darkness to the Jews. And I'm going to illustrate this if I get time. John chapter 9 verse 4. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. And why is it day? Because he's the light of the world. 
and he's with them. When, but the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Follow me so far? But then Jesus left, didn't he? So now, now that he's gone, is Israel, are they in the day or are they in the night? The night. Romans 13, 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. So there's coming, now Paul's speaking to the Gentiles. Romans 13, we're the Gentiles. We have the light on us while Israel has darkness upon them. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Because God's going to um, get rid of the darkness that Israel is in and bring them to a day, a new day. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. First Thessalonians 5, 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as how? A thief in the night. And again, my premise here is, is that this is Christ coming down to Israel and because his feet are pillars of fire, that indicates to me that it's nighttime. Now, look at this. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? Now, if you read the context of this verse, John eleven nine, 9, it looks like it has absolutely nothing to do with that whole story. John 11 is about the death and the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus throws in this statement. Are there not 12 hours in the day? The number 12 always points you to either the 12 tribes or the 12 apostles. We are following the 12 apostles. This is the Gentile age. And so we follow them. The 12 hours of day are on us right now. We're in the daylight. We have the light of the world. We can see perfectly the word of God and the works of God. Israel is still in the dark. So it's simple physics that while one part of the world is in light, the other part of the world is what? They're in darkness. So right now, the light is shining on us through the 12 apostles and we are walking in the light. But... As the TV says, as the world turns. One of these days, the darkness is going to be upon the Gentiles. Amen? They're going to be in darkness. But the light then will be upon who? The 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? I came up with that all on my own. I didn't read that in nobody's book. All right. <laughs> Go back to Revelation 10. Since we're moving right along. Actually, I don't believe it. I don't know what to do. I got done with my notes before the bell rang. Huh? I've never done that before. What do we do? You want me to turn Netflix on? Huh? Uh huh. Yeah. Mm hmm. Think of what rules over the darkness in Genesis 1 the moon and the stars. The stars represent angels. In this case, in this case, God specifically, thank you for bringing that up because that reminded me of a verse. God specifically uh, told Israel uh, of the gods that they were following. And God specifically mentioned the star of your God, Rimphan. So Israel, instead of following the one who made those stars, they were following and worshiping the stars by night. One of them was Rimphan. Um, one of them was uh, Chion and Molech. Um, I can't remember which one. I think Rimphan ends up being the planet Saturn that they're following. Okay? 
They're following these lesser gods, uh, just like an astrologer would. A astrologer gets up every day and looks at the, the stars and where they are and where the planets are and whose house is in who and so on. And they believe that that determines the course of your day, that the stars are dictating to you what you will and will not do. They, they, the stars, according to astrologers, dictate what, who you can and cannot marry. Um, what kind of job you will take, what kind of job you're specifically born for, uh, which is ridiculous. I was born in May. I'm a Gemini. But that doesn't mean that every Gemini turns out to be a good-looking, handsome preacher. Amen? And you can tell by looking at me. It doesn't work that way, does it? Do what? Yeah. <laughs> All right. You know what? I am going to let you go early. Let's bow to the Lord in prayer. That's what I think. He swears by himself. We'll get to that, but that's what I believe. He swears by himself since he can swear by no greater. I mean, that's odd to us. We don't swear by ourselves. Okay? I swear by myself that I'm going to... When you go in court, you don't say to the judge, I swear by myself that I'm telling the truth. Okay? You don't get to do that. Oh, boy. Uh, let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings. Uh, on your word today, thank you, dear God, for uh, what a beautiful book this book is. Lord, Father, give us, give us the desire, Lord, in our hearts to study it, to know it, to believe it, to live by it, memorize it, Lord, and then to share it with others. Because others, Lord, they need a cool drink of water. They need the words that are in this book to revive them and refresh them. Father, again, we pray for the people of Israel and we ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.